Good afternoon. It is June 26, 2017. We are here in Berlin and something wonderful occurred over the last weekend. Tangerine Dream performed two live concerts in Berlin on Friday and Saturday evening. And Ulrich Schnotz and Thorsten Kveschning performed their first live concert on the Sunday night. I'm now joined with both Ulrich and Thorsten. Good afternoon to you both. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having us. Right, so firstly I have to say thank you for inviting me to chat with you today and the generosity of allowing me to attend two shows over the weekend. How are you both after the shows? Exhausted. Well, exhausted. <laughs> no, it was fine. The whole yeah. weekend was mm -hmm. very okay, but kind of relaxed. So, was, yeah. So, 50 years ago, you know that you were both part of that unique history. How does it feel? Oh, I mean, for, for me, I would say it's, it really differs. Like, at some point, I still feel like it's a bit of a surreal experience because I obviously I've, I've been a fan of uh, uh, Tangerine Dream for a long, very long time and it's a bit of an odd situation to find yourself being part uh, of a band that you have been following for such a long time as, as a fan uh, essentially uh, and it's even weirder now uh, obviously uh, and in a number of ways also a bit difficult uh, where Edgar is not there anymore and uh, there is like a lot of added responsibility uh, and very unexpected uh, uh, responsibility uh, on, our sh on our shoulders uh, and like a situation that we had obviously very little time to uh, uh, adjust to uh, uh, as well. So it's, it's a mixture of different things. I mean first of all it's obviously extremely flattering and, and a great honor and uh, probably something that I, I wouldn't even have dared to dream 20 years ago. But secondly, it's also a, a very heavy challenge. Uh, and um, I think we both realize that it's a great responsibility that, that comes uh, um, with that position that we're in now, because uh, I consider the history of Chandra and Dream to be one that is very important, not only for uh, fans of uh, their particular output, but for electronic music in general, and probably, to be honest with you, even for popular culture uh, in, in, in general. And uh, yeah, that's it's quite a heavy thing, you know. I try actually try to not to think about it too much. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, as, um, on the first view, it's a very big honor. But um, so I, I'm with them for 14 years now, since 2003. So I'm 40 at this point, and I never did. Of, uh, uh, something as long as being in Tender Dream my whole life uh, um, because 14 years now so it's been quite a long time and this is kept maybe what the, the biggest part of my life is mm. being in Tender Dream yeah. if you have something in uh, uh, one action one role that is individually what were your first experiences recognizing realizing your enjoyment of Tender Dream and the style of music so I wasn't so much into electronic music as the um, genre um, uh, before I uh, get to Edgar and Tender Dream. So I was more in classical music, progressive rock, and in in the dark 90s and kind of gothic rock and gothic stuff. But um, that's but the good thing about it is that everything I knew know about doing electronic music I learned directly from Edgar programming the bass lines and um, arranging sounds and doing the arrangements so um, it had very big impact um, for, for composing music compu composing that genre of music so yeah maybe every, everything in, I do in the electronic music now I, I learned from Edgar well I think uh, for me Tender and Dream or what I how I would understand the idea of uh, the sound of Tangerine Dream or the philosophy behind the music filled a bit of a gap uh, in my life because um, I started getting piano lessons uh, at the age of uh, seven and I was at that point obviously very heavily influenced by uh, my parents' record collection as well because that was like the music that was the in the most e easy way accessible to me and there was a lot of jazz uh, and stuff like that there and but then like around 88 89 uh, acid house happened and that was like sort of like my first uh, the first time i was exposed to electronic uh, sounds and i was 
uh, I was like a, very, a, a child and I was like at night when my parents wouldn't notice it I was listening to the radio with with the cushion on it so that that, that, that uh, I was uh, I could hide the radio um, and like I said I was very fascinated by these sounds but at the same time uh, I think subconsciously uh, I was looking for something that would combine these otherworldly sounds and I like the more musical, conventionally or traditionally musical approach that I was used to from my father's jazz records and learning the piano. And uh, when, and in 90 or 91, I discovered Tangerine Dream because like a British electronica act, LFO, they listed like their influences uh, on the sleeve of their album Frequencies, which I loved uh, very much. And I, uh, you know what it's like when you're a fan, then you want to know what your heroes are influenced by, and that's why I went through that list. And Tender and Dream was on that list as well. And so, uh, in Berlin, actually, uh, on a school holiday, I, I bought like a cheap copy of uh, Phaedra, uh, no, sorry, Str Stratosphere, and uh, that was like probably one of the, the, the biggest musical awakening moments uh, in my life because that delivered exactly that kind of thing that I was looking for. It was it had these uh, this otherworldly quality sonically, aesthetically because of the electronic instrumentation that was used but at the same time compositionally it was rooted uh, as well in, in traditional structures uh, as well. So it wasn't like Acid House for instance which is obviously um, quite quite abstract in that sense and it's, it's not it doesn't matter what kind of chord changes are melodies uh, it is and um, yeah the fact that it brought these two things together then also made me realize that um, if I would uh, later on maybe when I would be a bit older and could afford it start using synthesizers I would also be able to realize the music that, that I had in my head and that I uh, would have loved to ma make so, you know? yeah. and so I think with our tender and dream I probably wouldn't be doing electronic music it's that uh, that simple really now, the new phase of Tangerine Dream after Edgar has sadly passed away over to another cosmic dimension, uh, the quantum years are evolving. Of course, quantum by definition sounds complicated. Does that mean the new phase, the new music, will be complicated, more sophisticated, and using higher tech hardware and software? So I was saying, it would be a problem to uh, say that your own music is more sophisticated than other people's music. So that, uh, but, um, the idea of, um, there were very detailed um, plans from Edgar what we should do and, uh, with the quantum music and uh, quantum years music and um, there were sketches, um, audio files, media files, cubist arrangements and um, even the um, procedure of, of, of doing live um, improvisations and concerts. Uh, uh, were well planned by Edgar. So there's, yeah. I, I think that, that that's commonly misunderstood, which is totally excusable, because I think Edgar didn't have enough opportunities to explain it properly as well. I would never take that whole quantum physics uh, thing one to one and that literally, because I think what, what Edgar uh, was essentially fascinated by in quantum physics can be understood even by a person like myself who doesn't have a very good idea on what quantum physics is actually about because I think for, uh, in a way it's essentially a metaphor for uh, the fact that it, it is something that questions our perception of reality which is something that is I think a continuity in Edgar's biography and to be honest with you I think it could have been something else uh, as well as some philosophical uh, uh, theory or, or, or whatever but, but that's really where where, where he always zoomed in and what he was fascinated by. Stuff that questions our perception of reality. And obviously, quantum physics, even I understand that, uh, does that in a very radical way because it even un questions our perception of such basic things as time, uh, for, for instance. Yeah. And I think he always wanted to have this kind of... Uh, um, this kind of sur surreal uh, ele element uh, in the music uh, as, as, as well. He wanted basically he wanted the music uh, to. Uh, that's, that's one of the expressions he used. Make human beings aware that there are a couple more doors that may be worth opening. And he was also very aware that something he also said that uh, the music itself can't do that job for you. You have to do that yourself. But at least the music can act as a reminder that there's a couple more doors that may be worth uh, opening. Huh? Yeah, that's very, very interesting. Thank you for answering that. A very complicated question. Um, right, another move forward towards the future. Of course, TD appears to have always been creating futuristic music, or certainly has a feeling of composing music for the future. 
I'm sometimes unsure how TD Music hasn't got the ability to lure more fans, more listeners. But it also appears that it is an intellectual music and that it does attract and appeal to a certain mindset and intellect. How does this resonate with you guys? Yeah, that's a difficult thing. Uh, uh, could, regarding a lot of um, the terms that you use, I would say yes and no. You know, Because right. yeah. the thing is, I think it's utopian music. Whether utopian, utopia is something that you locate in a particular future. I don't know. You know, we, we don't know. Uh, so I think at the moment we're living in a time where the best we can do is to keep certain ideas uh, alive and make sure they don't die. Whether we can be as, as brave and uh, as bold as to say uh, this is something that's going to be a rea reality in 2022 uh, or something, I, I wouldn't have the guts to do that under the, these circumstances. You know, I, I don't think I have to name any particular people or political events or I think everyone knows what I'm talking about yeah, you know, yeah. if you look at the current state of the world and um, yeah the same goes for, for a lot of these uh, things I think I think it actually ties in quite well with what I said before you know like the best thing music can do is to remind or to try to try to try to, try to remind uh, oneself about the fact that a different life would be possible, you know, uh, and that it's worth, uh, f it's still worth fighting for that and it's still worth keeping that, that idea alive, the dream will always be the same. Whether we're we ever going to manage to turn that dream into an, an actual tangible reality, um, sadly, is at the moment very difficult to predict. Do you feel that the music would have to be dumbed down or become more commercial in order to attract new listeners? Uh, and yes. In, in, in saying yeah, that, that uh, doesn't mean that we're going to do that. No, 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 no exactly. <laughs> no, no, just, I realise I've got more, more to add to that particular question. Sorry. I so, so no, no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like the fact you answered it so quick. Yeah. Um, but would you be prepared to do that to gain uh, more a wider audience? No. 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 Because I was I was going to also say, of, of course, this would be tricky because die-hard fans would hate this. But are you just appe appealing or appeasing to? Die Hard fans. Yeah, but it's not about that. I mean, for no. me, I, I mean, to be honest with you, um, I, I don't consider myself to be like an entertainer or, or, or a service service guy or something. Good, good. I'm first and foremost doing music for myself. Uh, I mean, I know that maybe may nope. even sound a bit arrogant, nope. but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to be honest. I'm, I'm offering something, yeah. and, and if someone refuses that offer, I'm not going to be hurt or disappointed. Uh, no, the, the, mu well. the music comes but, first. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and the idea that is behind uh, the music as well. You know, it's like with any idea, you know, you, you don't change your principles uh, uh, as well just because uh, it, it probably makes you a little bit certain things that you believe in make you a little bit less popular uh, you know well at least I wouldn't do that and I think it's the same with, with music as well at the same time obviously you have to be realistic uh, especially in our times you know like it probably since the 50s it probably hasn't been it hasn't been more difficult surviving as a musician uh, than it is now you know probably yeah. the golden age was like 70s 80s 90s you know where you could probably live on album sales alone that's not the situation that we're in anymore so obviously we do have to do stuff here and there bre bread and butter stuff uh, because we've got to pay rent uh, and yeah. food uh, as well but I would always try to draw a line between those things and uh, the, the stuff uh, that is Tender and Dream for instance or our solo projects which are really about realizing uh, a certain uh, uh, vision uh, th th that we have. And uh, I would never compromise the integrity of, of, the, of those projects, ever. Yeah, same by me. So I'm, I'm not caring about so uh, mainstream so much. The problem is uh, that would be a, uh, kind of a run after the number one position. So, um, so um, e even um, to be honest, uh, uh, some number ones are, uh, that doesn't match with my world of music. So I, I, I can't understand it for, 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 for reasons, or only my world. So um, I think they're doing the music, um, at least in our world, that we can do better than <laughs> making other people's music. <laughs> And so we're just doing our music, I think, and, and uh, with 
the idea of including Edgar's uh, idea. I think it, it would so. be quite absurd yeah. as well. I mean, because uh, if you look at our biographies, but even if you look at the biographies of uh, big heroes in that field, even Edgar's biography, I mean, you don't do this particular kind of thing. If commercial success or being popular is your number one priority. You know, then I would make very different stuff. You know, I would dress differently. I would perform differently. Yeah, I would actually perform. Then I, w- I would. You, would you start uh, singing? Um, <laughs> no, I think that would actually be a, a very big point against being successful. <laughs> yeah, I think that's something I shouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> but no, personally, I, I think that's a great answer, and uh, I think that's going to satisfy a lot of fans uh, because you're doing it for the right reasons. I think. Uh, so coming back to technology. Are there plans about to become involved in technology through music? Well, I guess we are to a degree because we we both know a lot of people who yeah. manufacture and develop uh, music music technology. But I, th- I wouldn't. So yeah, yeah. It involves has, uh, means um, doing uh, um, and and um, taking care of making tools for music. We are very involved. If, if it would mean to create algorithms of um, um, uh, self-composing music, um, we don't. <laughs> but, but are you uh, potentially active in still sort of developing uh, even yeah, the yeah. synthesizers and yeah. sequences? I mean, and yeah, obviously over the and, years. And do these people yeah, come yeah. to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that's, I've always found that really interesting uh, as well, because obviously as a musician, uh, and not necessarily a technician or a programmer. You have a lot of ideas as well. Some are unrealistic, and it's always interesting to discuss with people who actually have knowledge uh, in that field, who can also then tell you uh, whether there is hope that one particular thing that you're wishing for can be realized at some point. Like if processor speeds finally manage the necessary criteria or something like that. So, or you can help those. So sometimes yeah, I think we can even help sometimes those people as well yeah. to make the, their products more useful for the uh, uh, the consumers uh, uh, than in the end so there is a crossover there but I think I would never claim that, that I'm uh, yeah I, I don't know particularly uh, uh, tech, tech savvy or something like that so uh, I think it's 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 limited to a very defined area of usability uh, I would say where I think we can con- contribute like most other electronic musicians as, as well I mean that's nothing that's unique to us like uh, if you're doing that sort of thing, then you just know what would be useful. Yeah, we can only bring a uh, different view on, on, on the product, yeah. and, and um, it, from from simple things like the don't uh, put a button on the right side of the screen because I'm playing with the right hand, and I'm gonna edit it with the left hand, and my my, my hand is over the screen. It would make se- no sense for me, but some. Uh, Companies <laughs> there, but um, to to very um, detailed, subtle things, um, which maybe you just yeah explored by by, by people who's looking <laughs> hours and hours on it by making music, not by uh, designing it. Yeah. So that, that's maybe the thing we can bring. In. But uh, may, maybe uh, even is, is there times where you struggle to find what you're looking for? So, so there's something you, you yeah, want, yeah, a sound you like, and, yeah. or, or an idea that comes <coughs> through and you suddenly think, why, why isn't this working, or why doesn't yeah. this happen? And do, do you go back to the designers? or? Yeah, no, it, it, it goes both ways yeah. as well. So, I mean, again, I think I, I would rather not mention any names, no. but I can think of two good examples for both things. So there's like one uh, representative of a company that, that I'm in regular contact with, and uh, whenever a new version of that particular software comes out, we sort of talk about uh, bugs uh, and potential errors and how workflow could be improved. And uh, for a long time, I made suggestions, and he was very grateful for that. But like in the last three or four years, he always gives me the response, yeah, we'd love to implement that. But you know what, the company has, ch- has shifted their target market from like the, the pro thing to like the broad consumer range so none of those ideas that you are suggesting will ever be realized because it's too specific you know and that's not what the company is aiming anymore at the same time just uh, a couple of days ago the, I was very happy about that like some very legendary synth design person uh, uh, responded to an email uh, that I sent and we've now started a bit of a con- conversation how an imp- how an instrument that he has developed could be improved and he actually seems very interested 
and my uh, suggestions. And if that was, would be just the slightest uh, chance uh, that those would be realized, I would obviously be extremely happy because <laughs> that would be uh, very, very fascinating to think about those possibilities. So it goes, goes both ways, you know, like sometimes that way, sometimes the other. Yeah, yeah and then sometimes it starts uh, only, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to contact maybe every company um, from, from equipment I use just to um, ask them if they can remove the red and uh, green LEDs because I can't see the colors. So that's the reason I have blue uh, LEDs in every instrument. So there's a, there's a contact <coughs> to every company <laughs> of equipment I use because I ask them to change the colors of, of LEDs. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm moving on <coughs> yet again. Uh, yeah. I, I'm hoping these questions aren't phasing you. I mean, you're, you're doing excellent answering the questions. No. Mobile phones have ringtones. Operating systems have startup tunes. And of course, you have dipped your toe into gaming consoles. Are there more plans to get involved with game soundtracks after the success of GTA V? Definitely, yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. sure. So, um, the thing is, it's, it's a good. Um, that's very different from composing music for albums, um, for making music in live concerts, and even as a big difference um, of uh, composing music um, for, for films and movies, because um, you, you, you need to do other things, um, more atmospheric thing, things, um, more. Um, um, Co completely different structures because um, um, they run for hours in the in, 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 in games and, yeah. and and that's that's very in interesting part of, of composing. And, and I gather the, the, the children don't even know who they're listening to in a way. Yeah, for for years I guess in GTA Five. And then hopefully <laughs> something subliminally will yeah. kick in and yeah. they recognise they've been listening to Tangerine Dream. Yeah. And coming back to youth and apparently the way youngsters listen to music on their phones and MP3 players, apparently the, the young have a lot less listening span. Do you agree with this? And if so, how would this have an effect on creating new music? Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure whether it's so much a matter of uh, actually listening span, that's what you said, no, or yeah, yeah. attention span. I think it's, it's probably even a bit more serious. I think um, uh, the importance of music uh, has declined uh, um, quite rapidly. So I think in Torsten's and my generation, we're both like around 40. Um, I think when you were, like, say, 13, 14 uh, at school, your identity was mainly constructed on music, essentially, where like the clothes, the, the, the language uh, you used, uh, specific terms, uh, aesthetics. So it, it, it was very important whether you were, let's say, like in our generation, like a, a grunger or a raver or a goth or whatever. And I think uh, I always have the impression when I look at kids today that obviously everyone still enjoys consuming music, but it's not really the foundation of your identity anymore. So in that generation, it is probably of much greater significance, like what kind of iPhone generation you're using. or That's, that's what really determines pop culture today. And I mean, obviously, that is not a development that I personally see in a very positive light, and I hope that's going to change uh, again uh, eventually uh, as well. But it's a reality that we have to uh, put up with and co confront, obviously, as well. So, um, even the length of music, I think the, many of the young people, younger people than us, um, so, so Listen, they listen on clubs the whole night for music, and and even I think this maybe it's not a problem. It's not. No, I guess not. There's a re there's a revival on vinyl. I mean, even um, you know, so, some yeah. people have been saying that young people are actually going a bit retro and they're buying vinyl, and vinyl may change things perhaps. Um, it changed the, the dynamic. Um, no, not the um, audible dynamic, but um, we have to uh, arrange two sides. That's a big difference to, 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 to um, one go on 70 minutes. So we have to manage to, to get a kind of the intention span for 25 minutes and then rebuild it after turning the sides. Um, I think that's the biggest di difference. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm not so optimistic about that whole vinyl thing because first of all, I think it's like a very very elitist uh, thing. Like it's a very specific part uh, of of that generation uh, that does that. But it's it's not like a cross class uh, 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 thing. And um, 
I think that it, it bears the risk um, that certain styles of music that were always a bit of a minority uh, uh, um, uh, thing will turn into a bit of an ivory tower situation. And that's something I always disliked. I always, uh, I know that, that there will always be people who, who say like, oh, this is my kind of music, very special, and I'm so different because I listen to this and I don't want anybody else to find out about my favorite band. I was always the opposite. I always wanted to be, I always wanted a situation where good music, interesting music becomes very popular. I mean, that's why I actually am very grateful that I was young uh, in the 90s, which is probably the last decade where that happened, like where from kind of a lot of subcultural backgrounds you had stuff crossing over into the pop chart and uh, I greatly miss that because that situation now is completely gone I mean when is the last time that you had like anything remotely underground or off center in the pop chart must, must have been 20 years ago at least and uh, so uh, and I think like I said that vinyl thing is not really compensating uh, for that because it only applies to a very limited uh, dem demographic and I think you can also tell that from the fact that subcultural movements have a lot less power for that reason I mean uh, two examples are sitting right in front of you I mean Paul Thorsten was part of the sort of like goth prog uh, and that kind of uh, thing I was very much involved in uh, rave culture in the 90s and all those youth movements were powerful enough to have things like like in that, I grew up in a very remote place in Germany but even we we set up illegal parties we had a pirate radio station uh, we did a magazine you know you know all that kind of stuff that's that's all not happening anymore you know because like music doesn't have that con that connotation anymore like for us music was more than just music it was a lifestyle it was connected to certain ideas of social liberation and being free and wanting things to change uh, and I think I don't blame today's young generation we're not living in a world where the first uh, thing that comes to your mind when you wake up uh, in the morning is oh I want to have an alternative I want people to be free because the world is fucked up uh, at the moment you know you can't deny that but at, at the same time Obviously, giving up just and conforming is not a very good response to that as well. And I do hope that at some point there is going to be a generation again that rebels uh, against that. And, and also, and even if it's a hopeless uh, fight, you know, and you know that you're going to lose, but at least we've tried, you know. And I'm, 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 I'm actually quite proud and, and very grateful that I had the opportunity to be part of something. And um, I think because uh, I would say uh, in gen just. Uh, Across the board, I like human human beings, and I think those kids today they deserve that experience as well. You know, and I hope that at least future generations will have the opportunity as well to experience that. Again. The other thing worth mentioning is how much Tangerine Dream like to get involved with making soundtracks to movies and collaborations. Uh, Stranger Things being an example. So um, I think our, our, our music works maybe well with media and uh, media and movies and um, computer games so um, so, uh, so we are open to score <laughs> many <laughs> movies and uh, TV programs TV pro programs yes and, and collaborations definitely you're up you're up for collaborations yes depends on the collab collaborator but yeah <laughs> of course <laughs> yes what were the first Tangerine Dream albums you, you each purchased so I'll go to you Thorsten did you did you purchase a Tangerine Dream album? Um, so, so um, to be honest, I had a. Or were you given one? I had a compilation, but um, <laughs> I know Tangerine Dream is more for doing very strange interviews in um, my favorite magazines. Okay. Um, because Edgar always said, so I, I wasn't so into electronic music, and but I always read these Keys magazine and keyboards and were, all the stuff and. Um, it's like the main music, like it's like uh, future music. Yeah, and I'm always enjoying reading Edgar's interviews for, for uh, mostly, <laughs> to be honest, for very strange comments like um, pe uh, people mo mo multi modes are for people who can't afford two of the same synthesizer. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's a uh, yeah, well, 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 was a huge interview because of that kind of sentence and and. and uh, me so yeah. So you were more into the magazines. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. So what, what was listening to different music? But but you but when you were brought into Tangerine Dream, it's kind of a wonderful experience. Absolutely. So it was not that far far away from from, from my work. So so 
Um, like um, Edgar always enjoyed um, oh, King Crimson Genesis. So we have a, a kind of very uh, close um, view about using chords and, um, and melodies. This is not far away from progressive rock. Um, but as I listened to the uh, first Sandra Dreams album uh, uh, after it, so I, I really enjoyed fa very much Phaedra, Force Majeure. Um, so, so once you joined the group, then you actually went back th through the catalogue and you discovered yes. the album. And, and Sight. Yeah. I, I, I really love Sight. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm hearing things about Zoe. There may be a chance that you're, you may revisit. Another thing to redo. No. I think there's, there's a kind, kind of album that you shouldn't try to, to recreate. Um, maybe you can think of going a direction that's close to the idea behind Sight, but can't recreate or re-record it. Yeah, yeah. And yourself for it. But the first uh, your, did, you, yeah. did, you, did you purchase yeah, yeah. Dream? Yeah, yeah. I mentioned that before already, I think. No? So basically, I bought this LFO album, Frequencies, in I think 90 or 91, and it had that list of influences. And I went through that list, and that was pretty much my introduction uh, then to all the classics of electronic music. And eventually, I, I came to the point where Tangerine Dream was next on the list. And I was on a school holiday in, in Berlin. I actually remember that moment very well. I went to uh, a shop called uh, 2001, 2001. I'm not even sure whether that still exists, but they used to buy stock from uh, other shops and from record labels. And at the time, obviously, Virgin was preparing that definitive edition. So I bought the previous uh, uh, version, and uh, which was then uh, uh, this shop where they were doing the job of um, selling uh, selling all those older versions so that there would be space for Virgin to relaunch so the catalog. So you basically uh, bought a whole, a whole bundle of... No, no, I, I mean, I was so young then, you know, yes. like I, I, but I had enough money to buy a copy of Stratosphere and I, I simply chose that one because it had... Uh, a, a, the, the, I really liked the artwork. And yeah, and then I went home uh, um, and uh, um, I was always staying at my, my uncle's uh, place uh, uh, in those times in the school holidays, summer holidays, and, and listened to, uh, to that. And, and like I said, it was sort of filling exactly that gap that I always felt beforehand between the current electronic music that was happening then, which I liked because of the aesthetics and the sound and the otherworldliness, but it was missing that compositional uh, element that I also always really loved. And um, I was very fascinated by that. Also, by the fact that this album was made uh, or released at least in 1976, which is actually a year before I was born. Yeah. I mean, you have to imagine, like I, I, grew, I was growing up in a situation where kids like me, we were thought, the Acid House, that's the beginning of electronic music, you know? And then all of a sudden, you, what, there were people, and then from Germany as well, who did this in 1976. So that was uh, quite an eye-opener. And, and uh, you, you mentioned rebellion. So, mm -hmm. so what was your family like around, when, when they got to hear what you were playing? What, so when oh, they, well, did the they, records. Did, yeah, I, so did you, Strat Stratosphere went on the yeah. turntable and... Did you play it loud? I mean, did, did members of the family hear it too? I think that the most poignant thing I can say about my family that I was actually then even more disappointed by my parents because uh, I realized that they, because that was like an entrance point for me as well to check like on the more recent German history, like socially, politically, culturally. Uh, and I did realize that my parents actually did grow up in a very interesting time, but simply missed it, you know? And I, I just thought, Jesus Christ I mean you uh, and then I actually found out that Tender and Dream had actually played in Kiel once even Amandu had played there for free at the Kiel week that's like a yearly festival and I, I was uh, like saying to my you could have to my father you could have gone to all these things <laughs> and you could have been part of that movement in the, in the 60s and 70s because that's when they were studying as well and you you just missed it you know like so that was uh, yeah I was a bit of a disappointment I would say <laughs> Well, we, we won't dwell on this disappointment. No, 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 it's fine. Um, <laughs> okay, this, this might be an odd one, because um, it's probably never going to happen. Um, and it's a two-part question again. Uh, did you perhaps have a favourite line-up, or maybe a line-up that you would have liked to have seen work together in Tangerine Dream? Me, uh, are you... Yeah, I think it's just, mm, different, not as much as the... So I think... Um, mm, through the... Franke, like Force Majeure, yeah. 
or even the things with uh, Michael Hönig uh, were very great. Um, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, that's it for me. Uh, I would, okay. I would say that it's funny. I, I wouldn't even uh, have thought that we would agree on this so much. But I would say the same ones as uh, as Thorsten. So Fröse Franke and Fröse Franke Hönig. And I would add uh, of course, Franke Hasslinger uh, uh, as well, because yeah, that's a period that I really, really like as well, very much. Yeah. And, and just touching on Paul Hasslinger as such, I mean, he's still yeah. very much making soundtracks for movies. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, his, his latest work is, uh, I think, the Resident Evil soundtrack for yeah. the latest film, uh, Fear the Walking Dead. I'm unsure if you talk to him or connect yeah. to him. Mm. You do. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, I met him twice, three times in, in, uh, when we're playing in, 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 um, yeah. on the uh, west coast um, yeah, they come to the Tendron Dream concert and we see each other backstage, um, but, but we, we all sometimes chat on Facebook and yeah So that was kind of meeting your hero in a way? Yeah, so I, I think he's, yeah. A, he's great, I, I really, really, I mean he's done quite a few of my favourite uh, TD pieces uh, actually, I mean something like I mean, I remember when I bought it. So you said earlier on, maybe to give it a bit of context, that you explore a catalogue of a band, also to discover new gems and hidden gems as well, like less famous tracks. I like one situation that I will never forget uh, is when I bought Tiger and heard uh, Alchemy of the Heart uh, for the first time. I think I, probably, I was a bit older, probably like 16, 17. And uh, yeah, it's a bit embarrassing, but I have to be honest, like especially during that string part uh, 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 towards the end, I was actually, what's the English word? You know, like my eyes got a bit uh, teary and that was very emotional. That's wonderful piece of music like so, really so, it's, so it's great really to yeah. think that the emotions are hitting you guys because I mean the, the music itself is emotional yeah all, all of your work yeah, it's yeah, not absolutely. just atmospheric but it's yeah. emotional yeah. you know things touch yeah. they basically touch you that's the idea no? and so when you're making music it's touching you anyway or do you have them euphoric moments where you think suddenly yeah, uh, but it's, I mean I don't know if it's, that's the case where we never discuss this uh, uh, I'm, I'm really looking okay, forward yeah. to your answer my, my situation like for me making music and listening to music is very very different in the way that uh, I, I always feel like when I make music it's more like I process emotions that I have felt in other situations it's more uh, for me music almost has a bit of like a therapeutic function you know like quite often when I reflect on situations for instance situations that made me sad or maybe also sometimes situations that made me happy then a piece of music comes out of that but but when I listen to other people's music it's more like a direct emotional because that music then independently from the situation triggers certain situ emotions huh? so that's it's, it's quite quite two quite different things well, what's it like for you yeah, well, I think maybe um, listen uh, to other people's music is the empathy thing. So, mm. I think, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. So I think um, you you, uh, you try to feel what, what the composer felt at this moment. Um, to um, if you compose music by, by your own, is it, you have one chance to have a re reflected kind of view and uh, just to remember the thing and then composing uh, music or just doing it from the mo moment. Um, sitting in this moment at your instrument and hitting the record button and show, try things and then after it rewind which part is good, which is probably not. <laughs> so so this, was, this wasn't a scheduled question, but you've made yeah. me think of a question while you're discussing this. And now I'm thinking, so how does, how does sometimes these tracks begin? Is it because you may go into the studio and you may already have an emotion? And you think I, I want to? I want to tackle this. I want to see if I can put this into music. Do you, do you ever work on that basis? I think it's, it's, um, uh, you have probably no chance to um, keep your emotions outside the music. So it would be uh, no reason to make music to yeah. say I won't tell anything <laughs> from myself and my, my my feelings. So that it, it's, it's not the idea of making music. Hopefully. So so. Coming, I mean, again, I'm, I'm following a different script here. Um, I'm, come, I'm shooting off the hip. Um, but how does an idea for an album or a track manifest? Um, again, it would be interesting to hear what you yeah. say. But my technique, uh, if you want to call it that way, is actually like an anti-technique because I notice that it certainly helps if you've been like in a 
it, it helps me when I'm in a reasonably uh, relaxed environment and when I can sort of, um, yeah, when I'm not too distracted by other things. And then I basically try to shut myself down. So I sit down at the piano for half an hour and just, just play stuff that comes to my head. And when you're, I think always when you're at the point where, when you're the least conscious, you know, when it's almost without wanting to sound too hippy dippy, but when you're like, uh, uh, when the, your ego is uh, almost zeroed out, you know, then you. You get the situation. But did, would you say you feel you're actually entering the music? If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I, I would say like for me the best description would be to say it's like something happen is happening through you, you rather yeah. than a, a, a very, you know. That's I think that's a, that's a very important aspect as well, um, which any musician should remember, uh, and which would probably keep a lot of uh, people from getting too big-headed. Because if you if you believe in this idea that something is happening through you, then you are not going to develop this uh, Bono syndrome where you then think like oh I'm the king of the earth you know and I wrote that song you know I hate that when you musicians do that you should be very humble and you should be grateful that you have to the ability that I believe in principle every human being has but a lot of human beings are just unfortunately f forced to erase during puberty you know when we're all being t told you have to function you have to work from nine to five you have to follow the rules and uh, Musicians are just lucky enough that due to certain biographical uh, circumstances they can afford to preserve their inner child, you know? Yep. Because if you look at children, the funny thing is they're all creative, you know? And you put it like any child in a room uh, and with, I don't know, it could be a piano, could be pencil. Could be, and could be a cardboard box. Exactly. <laughs> and they, they will try to express themselves. So you see that that impulse is in any human being, but most human beings just kill that off because they're forced to. And I think if you keep that in mind, then you could be a bit more humble uh, as well if you're, if you're among those lucky few who have managed to main, main, retain uh, uh, that. No? So, uh, and, I, and I gather that's because when you first make I'll come back to you in a second Thorson but when <laughs> you you make a piece of music I mean it's uh, it is a part of you mm -hmm. and it is yours it's personal and then I believe you know and if, uh, you know it's you're, you're restrictive in the sense that that piece of music hasn't been listened to by anyone else but then it I think it's, it's for me it's different things I think there's one thing that is universal and that is actually not you and that's that's the general nature uh, of music and that's the beauty of humanity actually human beings are the only uh, species on this planet who do stuff uh, that doesn't make any sense because do we need music do we need paintings do we need books to me that's the most beautiful thing about human beings and that they create but not j just like on that uh, uh, cynical backdrop of like does it help us to procreate does it help us to gain profit we also do things which are completely senseless but beautiful uh, you know and that's universal that's not you that's that's an you, you universal uh, impulse I think the one thing that is you and that's wh where it separates also the good, the good artists from the ones who are probably not so good is, is, is then essentially aesthetics because uh, that's a very that's that's an intellectual thing that's that's something that requires uh, the, the processing of, of certain knowledge uh, and um, look at look at someone like Edgar uh, for instance I mean you can't even if you don't like Tangerine Dream if you do, even if you can't find any emotional connection to that music you've got to give him at least the credit that he invented um, a sound landscape, a soundscape that is instantly recognizable uh, as his and um, that is it's, it's a very unique hand, handwriting and that's that's the, the thing that I would credit to the respective individual person but I think the, like I said, it's, that's a different thing to the, the overall more general impulse of, of one being able to create Okay, so it's over to you Thorsten to ask yeah. the original question so uh, I think it's a bit a big, uh, bit different. So um, uh, because composing is not a linear thing for me, it's not a linear working process. So, um, so I start composing sketches and and uh, tiny bits of music and um, recording ideas. And after a while, the music itself controls what happens to the music. So um, it, it uh, the music itself decided which. How it is falling, which which uh, which uh, colors the sound should be, and um, so the idea of, of doing this is um, to serve the music more than um, try to get your own 
I'd like to have that way or this way. Um, uh, very often the music decides which way it sh sh should go. But what was it like being invited to join the group? Well, for me, very unexpected. Uh, actually, I was I was just visiting uh, Edgar, and I, I I didn't expect that uh, at all. So it came completely out of the blue. So um, they're just just searching for for someone in Berlin, and uh, I think three three guys were invited by someone someone who worked for Edgar in his <laughs> office. Um, of course, Martin Kasperzak um, was oh, ch ch yeah just. Talk to him, try, maybe, yeah, it's okay, maybe it's not, and yeah, it was very unspectacular in, in, in a way, but we got an email and we pho uh, phoned three times at Edgar, and then I, yeah, just spent two weeks together in Austria, and yeah, that's a... <laughs> and, and in the theory, I, mean, I don't know if it worked the same for both of you, but were you invited to meet Edgar, discuss things, talk things or was it like a as, as you put it earlier with a nine-to-five job was it like turning up at the studio at a particular time uh, and there's your machine could you have a tinkle with that and see what you can produce yeah, in my way it was so so we, the discussion before where which um, uh, sequence do you use uh, to, um, because it was was the idea to um, helping by the production of the Dante uh, CD um, Recording vocals, uh, arranged strings, and yeah, and so we should use the same sequences, the same software, some of the, uh, to 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 be familiar with with his synths and yeah, you know, on working uh, yeah environment. And yourself, Alan? Yeah, I, I don't think I've got so much interesting about that to say because I I didn't really have the opportunity to work very long uh, no. with, with Edgar, and, and I think in that time frame it was pretty clear that he would just give me some some files and then um, expected me to do something with it at, at my place. So I was yeah, I, I don't know whether it would have developed in a, in a way where we probably would have been in the same place in, in Austria. But yeah, it didn't happen in that, in that. It was only half a year. So. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the weekend, he gave me like a hard drive yeah. with with uh, uh, files, and that's what I then used uh, uh, to 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 do those uh, first two tracks uh, that we did together. So, what was it like performing on stage with Tangerine Dream for the first time? Uh, that was kind of strange for, for because of the performance situation. So, I think it's 2005 Shepherd's Bush. Um, uh, I think the ha first half where uh, Jerome Edgar and me are playing with the back to the audience on on. Uh, there was a Pedra 2004, five must be five, fifty four yeah. plus five. And after this, I had to turn to the audience and play a uh, song for the way the piano intro, and um, recognizing the audience for the first time, because it would have been very uncool to have a look over the shoulder and how many how many people are there. <laughs> but it was a fine moment and um, the other guys uh, left the stage at this time so it was kind of um, yeah, yeah, a first on test on uh, how, how you, I... Do you, do you feel like they set you up? Or? I think it's okay. The, I think the first guy I recognized was Colin Jusen. <laughs> yeah. uh, shouting fantastic man. This is the Irishman. Yeah, yes. yeah, no, the uh, yeah, Wales. Okay, the yeah. Welshman. Yeah, well, so, fantastic man, and that broke my eyes for a moment, and then I could enjoy it more than sitting half an hour and don't look to the audience, but it was fine. That was the first concert. Yeah, in hindsight, I think it's a bit unfortunate because um, by the time when he asked me um, that those gigs in Australia, they was where. Well, I'm not sure whether they were already finalized and booked, but they were definitely on the horizon somehow. And uh, there were he had like loads of ideas for how things could be changed and all the new stuff, a lot of what we're trying to uh, realize uh, now. But then, as usual, like as it always is with bands, we had uh, some pretty bad time management, admittedly, and um, uh, we were in the situation that the preparation for Australia was a bit rushed, and so we decided to to cut down on a lot of the uh, the new ideas, and it, it didn't quite live up to the, the plan that that, that existed. So um, in hindsight, I think that that's obviously a real shame because it would have been the last opportunity to do that together with with Edgar. And uh, yeah, that didn't work out uh, then. Yeah, but yeah, that's the way it sometimes goes.
So now, I'm not asking this because I want to know where the stash of equipment is, but is there a huge vault out there with a ton of equipment ranging from antique right to present day? Lots of um, Edgar's uh, old instruments are uh, in a spacement in Austria. Wow. And um, in varying conditions. Yeah, there's a couple of old wine room. A uh, wine cellar. Yeah, wine cellar, but it, it, before he bought it. and. Um, maybe not in the, the best climatic conditions for, for uh, yeah. Some of the instruments. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a problem. But, um, but have you seen them though in, in present day? Yeah, you know, and, yeah sure, sure. But, you, but you? Um, so um, uh, soon after soon, we took up to to the studios and to rescue them from the rescue them <laughs> for for way. But yeah, that was actually good fun. fun. We even used yeah. some of uh, uh, the the old sounds uh, and stuff. Huh? Yeah. So we found some modules with some, some uh, interesting yeah. 80s sounds. Uh, remember, I found well, what's this uh, FM uh, uh, module? The the eight DX sevens in one unit. What's that called again? Um, TX um, eight yeah. sixteen. And yeah, so that space, is space eight, you can yeah. you can stack like uh, eight DX7 sounds yeah, on top eight. of each other, which actually to me explained a bit of a mystery because like some of those really um, punchy, really heavy sounds they had in this sort of like underwater sunlight mm. uh, phase and a bit before. Yeah, two of them actually, uh, about sixty. I was I was always <laughs> wondering how that was done, no? and that was very yeah. interesting to switch on that unit and to listen to some of those uh, uh, yeah. things because then I understood ah okay it sounds so huge because it's essentially eight GX sevens uh, or sixteen yeah. even stacked on. Top of each so others. that was really a, a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean that you was were great fun. you were you were, you were going yeah. back in time discovering yeah. the albums and things yeah. you listened yeah. to and when we, you weren't in the group, but now you're playing with it yourself. And we love the uh, DMX drum computers. Uh, which is a huge, very yeah. big thing and, and works perfectly after 30 or 40 years. So it's unbelievable. And yeah, and actually, yeah. Uh, we, we discussed that before. Sounds uh, better than, um, uh, yeah, it was like a lot of, I mean, there are plenty of professionally sampled libraries available, mm -hmm. but there's something special about Edgar's. Uh, uh, is it DX or DMX? One, DMX. Uh, DMX. DMX yeah. Yeah, have even um, two of them, but yeah. one, one clap is very different, yeah. a very, very strange mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. And um, yeah, we, we used um, the the Minimoke, uh, his Prophets, his <coughs> Serenas, and yeah, it's all there and um, still work. Uh, we are some some are still working, some not others. So, would you say there would be enough artifacts and musical equipment to rival Pink Floyd's recent exhibition? Um, so, uh, maybe there's not the number of instruments or the uh, or the or the. the uh, Amount of in instruments, so we we could have bought sorry cork radius, but, but, but maybe this is not, not as much as interesting. Uh, now to something slightly off track, or oh, as Molly Parker say, now so now for something completely different. Uh, the connection with music and humans, we hear bird song and we understand whale song. Therefore, is there a thought that music is a form of language, and would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I, I always. I mean, that's that's. I think that's quite a common. I think you were touching on that earlier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's quite a common thing that people say. You know, and I think. It, I think that the, the word language is maybe a bit difficult because mm -hmm. we, it's sort of defined in a specific way. But I think what, if you see it as a language, maybe you could say that it's. Um, it's a it's it's a very uh, effective or, or a more effective language than language in the traditional sense as a spoken word to communicate emotion uh, for instance yeah so because tangerine dream is basically recognized across the planet with different mm -hmm. cultures mm -hmm. and yeah different races yeah and yet it's talking to all these people as you say probably emotionally of course it's music without words and um very rhythmic music. So uh, scales uh, are varying um, all over the world, but um, rhythms are very in common. Uh, I think m rhythm are more global than scales. Might be a bit strange. I heard this recently. Apparently, cows can produce more milk when listening to certain types of music. Apparently, slow jams and classical music. And I gather even humans work well to music, but sometimes conflicts of interest can affect also. When you guys work in the Tangerine Dream studio and start working on a new project, do you have a clear vision of what you intend to put out? How, how fans will respond, or is it entirely what works for you and your own interests? I just wonder today how fans impact the Tangerine Dream journey. 
Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question, but if I do understand it correctly, I would just say one thing. I think um, I think some of the, the, the beauty of music for me as a listener actually is that it surprises me. And so I would actually want my favorite artists not to be influenced uh, by uh, yeah, my preferences, therefore, because then they obviously wouldn't do that. They wouldn't surprise me. They would just sort of please me and probably remain um, quite static. So uh, I'm generally not sure whether the relationship between people who create any, not just music, but books, uh, films, and, and, and fans should be that close anyway, because I think uh, that's one of the more recent uh, civilizational achievements, I think, that, that we have reached, that we've separated those two things, and that uh, the artist is not under the thumb anymore of a king or an emperor or a, an audience, and that you're not hired to do certain stuff, but that you have uh, the, the freedom to create um, something that's coming from other sources, which very much depends on what you believe in. Uh, like I said, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a religious person, but I would probably argue that there is a certain spiritual uh, element to, to making music or being creative in generally because so far we don't really know uh, where that uh, sort of happening through you thing that I mentioned earlier on is coming from and it may be just biochemical thing in our brain it may be some divine intervention could be we really don't know what it is yet and uh, therefore you know like um, I, 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 I actually try to avoid thinking about this too much as well because I'm always worried uh, that's going to kill it off, uh, you know, like, so uh, it's, it's good that that's there and if it was just a biochemical thing, maybe fair enough, but I'm not even sure whether we necessarily have to know that. Right, without a doubt, liking Tangerine Dream would be the top reason for listening and following the group. Obviously the musical appeal, however today the whole part of following Tangerine Dream is an immersive and interactive experience. You guys are responding to posts sharing things have been really fun and entertaining online what is your take on this so it's um, I guess we are not acting anything so so um, it is a natural thing so if, if, if it's in entertaining people it's a good thing if you want to be entertained um, yeah and, and that's my, my view on it so, um, so maybe it's it's it, it, um, but removes some kind of the magic if we know too much for people, but um, I don't care about this. Yeah. I think we are in a bit of a transitional period uh, at the moment, culturally in general, and you're asking questions about stuff where it's very difficult to see at this point where this is gonna go. So that goes for the vinyl thing, for instance, I think it goes for this uh, as well, because there's good things uh, about this social media thing. I think it generally it probably has made musicians uh, a lot more pleasant and more humble beings as well, because uh, you're confronted uh, much more di directly with the reality of the world outside, which means that it's much more difficult for you to hide in your ivory tower and think that, that you're God. But on the other hand, I think there is also that, that problem uh, with it that, uh, that it can sort of devalue um, music and in the way that the focus shifts. So there's one thing that I notice, and we've discussed this in, pr in private as well several times, that I find problematic, which is if we both share stuff on our Facebook profiles, for instance, that is personal in some kind of way, like a uh, What's, what could I think of? Like we went on a boat trip uh, today, something like that. Then, I don't know, a couple hundred people were like the picture. If we announce a new music release, then it's going to be less than that. And you see that this kind of this whole thing encourages uh, uh, a way of perceiving, um, yeah, people who do music, uh, write or, or, or whatever, with a focus that shifts it towards like some kind of celebrity thing, which is always, I think, like the, the least uh, thing. Uh, that I was interested in, uh, you, you know, like uh, it's, um, I don't understand it uh, as well because none of these people they don't know Thorsten personally, they don't know me. So uh, if you like my music, then that that's wonderful, and I really appreciate that. And uh, but I don't quite understand why you like it more when I share some kind of detail what's on my shopping list uh, or something. That, you know, that is an extremely good answer. Do you know how enthralled and taken the audience was on Saturday night when Carolina came on stage and played the theremin? Um, well, I probably know uh, less than anybody else because I'm even playing 
most of the time with the back to my audience. So did you notice that? Uh, <laughs> um, so um, I really enjoyed it. We, we, we yeah, both yeah, yeah, we were talking absolutely, about absolutely. Really so, yeah. Um, yeah. so so we you met her um, on, on Saturday. Yeah. Not not before. I'm, I'm very bad in, in responding emails, and she wrote several times for the last three months, but never responds. Not <coughs> not uh, not for a reason. I made the reason that I'm not responding emails. Um, but uh, um, and the problem was we were playing the main set stage and coming back for the encore, and I wasn't sure <laughs> if she's there in the moment. And she was sitting somewhere in the audience, and then um, yeah. So she, she appears. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and I think it was very. It, it fits very much. Was very, uh, it, it, very it, good in musical. From, from our in the audience, mm -hmm. it sounded like Tangerine Dream. The the, 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 the which the, is the, a good thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it was yeah. like, and I'm not, I, 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 I never even seen this instrument before. Yeah. I, I thought it was from the future. I mean, there's no physical pressing of buttons or anything, and uh, hands were moving in a particular way, and this thing was making noise. And yeah. yeah, it seemed to fit, and it seemed to be futuristic, but it was from the past. No, it was not, not, not any cliché thing. Either it's not the um, Enterprise um, or Star Wars thing. <laughs> um, so, so I, I, I had a second fear about that. That mm. should, could be too too much uh, cheesy cliché sound of uh, theremin, like 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 the horror or movie or. A plan nine out of space uh, kind of soundtrack, but but yes, um, yes, yeah, it was kind of like I, I thought the same thing, and it was yeah. kind of like a Theramine 2.0 experience yeah. or something like yeah. that. No, yeah, so well, I was really surprised by that as well. Um, he, he, yeah. uh, played, it played uh, one of the first um, before Mo got called it was um, uh, called Mo. It's called Big uh, Big, uh, Big Briar. Uh, it was uh, from Robert um, who um, took the plans from from. Um, Theramine, who was living, I think, in New York at this time, uh, 20 years, uh, maybe 15 years uh, before, and um, it's an uh, it's an instrument, it's a Moog instrument. Before it was called Moog, yeah. and it's, yeah, with lots of effects which maybe fits better in our in, in our music than just a dry theremin, which is not more or less uh, uh, less filtered sinus wave, which is maybe. Uh, it's, it's maybe too present for our music, so it's, uh, the, the, to, to use the um, uh, amount of effects uh, like delays and reverb to make, makes us more, uh, match more in our music. And it was good, I guess. Yeah, we, we, we found some melodies yeah. together, yeah. Well, and we, we, we said, I mean, that, that much I think we can say we certainly realized afterwards that the audience liked it as well because we talked to people you know, after yeah. the gig. But uh, during the, the gig, I actually never realized that much whether people like it or not. No, it was, it was, it was very much appreciated and every, everyone liked it. I think everyone was sort of um, mesmerized by it. That's great. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that, that led a lot of people to ask, could Carolina be offered a future role in Danger in Dream? You, you talked to her, no? Yeah, I talked to her, too. yeah. Um, I'm not sure um, what, what her plans are. So, so there's no idea to uh, get, ask her for the next 10 concerts, but um, I think it worked very well, but yeah. um, she lives in Leipzig now and had the idea of living all over the world for the next three years, she told me. And um, so we, we were, yeah, I guess we were going to met even to um, maybe uh, edit or hear the other, we recorded it. So we have, maybe should hear it together to, to share opinions and then we're going to see. Of course, of course. I was, I, was, I was out afterwards after the concert and people were saying they would love to hear tracks from Firestarter Live. Is this potentially possible? Would you, would you go back to I something like everything this? Everything is potentially possible to, um, for, for a kind of a new version for, for playing on concerts. But yes, so, well, every concert has limited time. Yeah, and, and that's the biggest problem. There's <coughs> much, so a huge catalogue of more than 1,200 tracks, I guess, or, or even more. And so to choose um, <coughs> tracks or, or songs for the live concerts is very hard all the time. Um, 
I think so far as well, um, the, re the reworkings that we did, the criteria was pretty random. No, I don't yeah. think we have like a... So, I mean, personally, I really like uh, the, the Firestarter soundtrack, so... Uh, but um, probably, probably just depends on whether it's going to pop up in a conversation before one of the upcoming gigs. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll look forward to that, if, it, if it's possible, if it's doable. I'm understanding that the record label might be restricting the amount of music that can be released each year. How will this affect you, your creativity? Uh, will it give you the ability to choose from a larger database when you uh, choose to release new tracks and albums? I mean, no, well, there may not be any truth in that, but... Um, but you know that, uh, I mean, basically since the late 90s, uh, the Tender and Dream stuff was all self-released, you know? so Yeah, through Eastgate. Yeah, so, I mean, that's obviously... That doesn't apply uh, for... Is, it, is Eastgate closing, though? No. no. Eastgate is going to remain... I think so, no? Yeah. No, no, it's, 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 it's still yeah. existing. Yeah. For, for um, like, I think the uh, session CD is, is going to be released at, yeah. uh, at Eastgate and... Um, so maybe I should retract this because because mm. I'm hearing stories. And that, that's what I'm saying. That would be more a question for uh, Picture Palace music and Schnauz and questioning and Schnauz. No, yeah. that's on external label. It doesn't really apply to Tender Dream. So, so Tender and Dream haven't just got. A, you could still produce what you like. Yeah. When you like. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So so we were just um, um, going to release the next album on, on a different label. Yeah. But um, it doesn't mean, mean that, that we never going to release anything on Eastgate. Yeah. So I think um, uh, Bianca is, uh, is, is very uh, into Eastgate, so um, the idea is to, to keep it alive. Yeah. Well, this is really good news. And, uh, I, mean, and the, I, I mean, that the, I mean that's, that it's funny, like all these, some of these questions as well, that would have made sense like, like 30 years ago, where you had record labels who did like six album deals uh, and exclusive contracts and stuff like that. It's a very different world out there. So maybe it could be a problem on the big label to um, uh, say we, we need 10 um, advertiser campaigns a year for, for 10 albums. Yeah. That, that would be maybe the problem. But, uh, yeah. I understand that Tangerine Dream performed again live in Holland later this year. Uh, and there is also a new album release called Quantum Gate. And also there's a book coming out in July. So there's, there's lots of things happening. Can you shed any light perhaps when Quantum Gate is going to be released? Yeah, Quantum Gate is going to be released on the 29th of September, uh, which is actually the 50th birthday of Ten Twin Dream. And um, I think that, um, there's a pre sale campaign on, on Pledge Music, which is still uh, is, is on at uh, this moment. Um, then the concert in uh, the Nether Netherlands in um, October 21st. Um, there are some more in the pipeline, but not, yeah, with a signed contract. So it's always a bad idea to, to advertise things that maybe are 5%, but only 95% fixed. So something could happen. Um, but yeah, and, and the book is going to be released <coughs> in next month, so which means end of July or, or mid July, whatever. After the reception of the gigs here in Berlin, I believe fans have a lot to look forward to in the future. You guys look like you're having a lot of fun. <laughs> I mean, by, by, by our standards, actually, uh, I can say yes, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so, well, so we, we, we don't dance on stages. Um, yeah, maybe... Um, so, um, we're not the ever smile as person on stage but we had fun and, and it, it, I think it's especially for me Saturday was was very good the, um, including the session but the whole set was, was, was very good I guess um, I think the uh, environment of the uh, Ballhaus Rixdorf uh, um, room which was an odd rehearsal room of Tendron Dream was kind of inspiring. We, we, we were there on uh, the day before, setting up things and, and rehearsing and playing another session, and um, that was fine. And doing our own uh, or, or, or duo album um, for Boston, it kind of a new thing. So we never did this before. So it was for, for me, it was a very good, um, yeah, weekend, but with, oh, including the two workshops, which may, could be for, in, from my point of view. Um, I, I could have a little bit proof and maybe if it's a next time uh, uh, situation or, op or option, but I think it's a, it's a good, well, it's a good weekend.
It, cer it certainly was. Um, the improvisations just keep coming. You really have to be at the venue or miss you, you, you miss something special. That's for sure, isn't it? Um, look, I'm going to wrap this up now. Uh, so I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Long live Tangerine Dream. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again. Thanks thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me.